Well, I think the, the key topic that everybody's talking about these days is what I call the world of abundant capital. It just feels as if we live in a world where, uh, you know, savings is outrunning investment and that's creating pressure, I think, on everybody who's in the investing business, um, either on the LP side or on the GP side, to kind of uh, find rates of return around the world that are consistent with the liability structures they have if they're LPs or with the promises they've made to LPs if they're GPs. And I think we see that at the, at the buyout end of the market uh, around the availability and cost of leverage and the, and the incentives that that creates around pricing and the like. Well, I actually think the industry's been far more disciplined this cycle perhaps that in prior ones. You also see it on the growth end of the spectrum, clearly with some of the valuations around technology world in particular. We actually did have an international companion fund in the late 90s when the firm had begun to invest more internationally uh, uh, at the time. And we've done it more recently last year with an energy companion fund given the size and scale of that opportunity. But we've always liked the core diversified fund because it keeps the sense of ap uh, it keeps the sense of risk and reward absolute. What I mean by that is, we're not making relative decisions that says this is the best thing I've seen in technology or healthcare or Asia this year. Uh, it says there's an absolute sense of risk and reward. We're always trying to achieve that for LPs. And as the world changes and fluctuates, we see opportunity set change by industry or geography or stage. We can be more nimble and flexible and think our way through that versus kind of trying to kind of target a pool of capital at a moment in time that may or may not be the best time to be thinking about investing. In fact, I'd say by and large over the long period of time what I've seen is the best time to raise money and the best time to invest money are rarely in sync. And so by having a core diversified fund, it gives us the capacity to invest consistent with what we think our pacing is, but gives us flexibility to kind of wander where the opportunity goes, but to always do so with an absolute sense of risk and reward. I moved to Hong Kong uh, at the end of 1993 and set up our businesses uh, in 1994. So we celebrated our 20th anniversary uh, last year of doing business in China as well as in India. Um, you know, I think when I first got there, I showed up with literally not much more than a business card. So I think my ambitions were to find a place to sit. Uh, uh, but it has been a phenomenal and fascinating, personally rewarding opportunity to kind of see uh, the development of that part of the world over the last 20 years. Um, we now have a third of our firm, more than a third of our firm, that lives uh, in that part of the world, in Asia. And we have something like that that's a part of uh, about that same percentage in our most recent fund. So it's become a meaningful part of the firm. Uh, China and India would be the two largest places outside the U.S. where we invest. Um, and so professionally, uh, it's been uh, rewarding in the sense of the opportunity for Warburg Pincus. But personally, uh, it probably still represents the uh, I don't know, the, 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 the most uh, interesting time of my life in terms of a chance to sort of see uh, the transformation of that part of the world over the last couple of decades. Opportunities set in both China and in, are interesting and we've begun to explore opportunities elsewhere in the region. We've invested in Vietnam now and Indonesia now. And so we're thinking about other players. We're also increasingly, I think, not just in, across Asia, but one of the other um, uh, advantages of our firm is because we run in such a globally integrated manner. Again, that single global fund, not uh, barons or fiefdoms around the world. It gives us an ability to interact with businesses where they do business and where the customers are and where their operations are, which are increasingly global in nature themselves. And so that opens up an opportunity set for us, which we think is unique. I don't think there's any doubt that that, uh, that, that has, uh, you know, beyond exuberant, um, that there's a bubble that exists in that space. I think what people always miss, though, and, you know, we learned the same lesson back in, in 2000, 2001, is there'll be some great winners that come out of this as well. It doesn't mean everything does badly. Um, uh, there are some great successes. I mean, Amazon was born of this vintage uh, in the prior cycle and others as well. And there will be some really sizable winners. I do think there's no doubt uh, that there's also a lot of money getting spent in things that will, in hindsight, not have been productively deployed. But I would say, more broadly, a lot of this is creating capacity and infrastructure and the like in that part of the world. It's going to say load, lay the seeds for, you know, a whole series of, eco of interesting economic developments. I'd also say it's financed in a way. Most of this is equity, so it doesn't have repercussions back into the banking system. 
So, you know, some people do well, some people don't. That's the nature of the private equity risk reward business. So, um, I think, you know, we are excited about a lot of what we've done and have done uh, quite well in things like uh, 58.com and Kodai and, and Yushin and, and Leapin and, and Howdai and others. But at the same time, I think we are, we are worried uh, that we're already, that it, that it feels uh, pretty frothy. Uh, one of the most fascinating things about the energy business, if you look over 100 plus years, is that the return on invested capital in energy has been somewhere between 10 and 15 percent for most of that 100 years. Leads and lags as you get price change. But when oil was a dollar, that was true. When oil was ten dollars, that was true. When oil was a hundred dollars, that's true. So there's always this great debate about what the price of oil is going to be. But what's fascinating is the relative consistency of the return on capital in the industry. So our strategy really from the beginning has been less based on trying to predict the price of oil or gas and it's been on creating it at the drill bit, well by well, field by field. So we've created 40 odd E&P companies over the last 20 years, always with a little bit the same formula. Enormously talented management team, uh, application of new technology focused in a particular basin, and you can perform a standard deviation or two better than that average, get a little going concern value, you earn private equity rates of return. The downturn, uh, while it had some effect on very old companies of ours that were mature, publicly listed, they get, uh, we had very little in the way of uh, damage in terms of, you know, gotcha transactions that we felt like, why'd we do that price change? So the opportunity set we're seeing now in terms of talented executives, opportunities with companies uh, whose uh, access to capital was interrupted, um, plays in the oil field services, which is the way you get uh, changes in cost structures largely comes out of the hides of uh, the services players. Um, and some changes in where the flows are around the world. Um, we think it's an enormously interesting time to be in the, uh, to be in the energy business. Our uh, view has always been simple. We've been prepared to share the benefits of scale through reductions in fee have for a long time in order to basically preserve what we think is the core, the core uh, attractive feature of the business, which is carry. Um, but, you know, I think for others, as they become public or become multi-asset class players, the challenges become a little bit different. Asset classes also become regulated, and that's created a whole series of discussions between GPs and LPs. You know, I've always thought the asset class at its very core had two really fundamental advantages. It was long dated and illiquid, so you, you worried about what you paid for it, and you worried about what you sold it for, and you didn't really have to worry about what happened in between. Uh, and second, it had a very simplistic alignment of interest. Um, where if the companies did well, the entrepreneurs you backed did well, the funds that invested in them did well, the LPs did well, and the GPs did well. And I think we all need to remember those two core elements and be careful about things that eat away at the margins of those and take away what is the core comparative advantage of the asset class.